Hey everybody and welcome to Story Church, whether you are joining us online or in person. Hey, we're so glad that you are here with us. Thank you for stopping by. So we are in this new neighbor series. It's been amazing so far. This Sunday we have a guest speaker and we are so excited about that. So um, the first announcement is as we're continuing and learning about how we serve other people, how we love other people, how to be a good neighbor, not just who our neighbors are, we can't wait. As we announced last week, we are going to be doing a hybrid model this summer where we are going to be doing services and then outreach. We are so excited about this opportunity and we love, of course, for you to join the team. No matter what you physically are and aren't able to do, you are an integral part of Story Church and we want to see you at those outreaches. And so we are so excited. Would you be praying for us for all of those outreaches this summer? We can't wait to see what God is going to do through Story Church. And we know that the church is not just the four walls that we meet in. It is the community outside of the church. So we can't wait for that. The next thing is your connection card. If you are a first time guest or a returning guest, we'd love for you to fill that out. We want to give you some information and say thank you for coming and get to know you. We won't bother you a ton. But other than that, we are so glad that you are here and we just can't wait to see what God does in this service. Thanks, guys. All right. So for those of you that don't know me, I just want to introduce myself again. We did this earlier, but I am Pastor Spencer. I'm one of the lead pastors here. My wife, Sarah, was up here as well. We co-lead Story Church, and we're thankful for those of you that came this Sunday. This is your first time. We have a few first-time guests in the house. So let's go ahead and clap for them. That's exciting. We're grateful for you guys taking time to be with us. And this Sunday, we actually have been very blessed. We've got one of our board members and friends here, Ryan Kite. He's a uh, preaching today, and he led from the Keys, so you guys are in for a treat. Um, you never know, he might get super excited and like lead from the keyboard, I don't know. Um, so we'll see what's in store. Um, but we're in a new series, this is part two of it, it's called Neighbor, so hopefully you've seen a little bit of that. If not, um, this is going to be a great intro to that for you guys as well. So you guys go ahead and welcome Ryan, we're excited to have him with us today. So Story Church, good morning. Okay, you got to give me your energy this morning, all right? So when I say good morning, I'm, I know that this is farther south than where I live in Virginia, but we pretty southern in Virginia, all right? So I need you to give me like the biggest good morning that you can give me. Okay, can you do that on the count of three? One, two, three. Thank you for welcoming me to Florida. I appreciate that. You guys are so kind. Man, I just wanted to say a few things. Uh, it's an honor to be a, a board member, a part of Story Church. And I remember when pastors uh, Spencer and Sarah uh, called me, I was sitting in a Taco Bell parking lot. How many of you know great spiritual things happen in Taco Bell parking lots? Um, with my wife, Lindsay, and uh, yeah, I'll get to know them in a second. Uh, but I was sitting in this Taco Bell parking lot, and they said, you know, we've been praying and searching and talking with some 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 churches and how we want to do things. And and Ryan, we're just believing and thinking that, that you would be a good fit for this. And I put the phone on mute. See, they didn't hear this part. I put the phone on mute, put my uh, chalupa down, and I said, oh boy. <laughs> so, so, so anyways, uh, can we just do something real quick? I, I, I got to do this. Can we honor Pastor Spencer and Pastor Sarah for all that they're doing in this community? If you want to stand up, it's an honor. You know, if you want to give them some recognition, I just got to tell you something. When they asked me to do that, I immediately, you guys have to see, this is not I don't do up and down church. If you grew up in church where you like stood up, sit down, I don't do that. So we're just going to stay seated, stay comfortable, drink your coffee, enjoy it. Um, but when they asked me to do that, it was an immediate yes, because I just knew the heart of who they were. I knew the community. I didn't, I've never been to Claremont. I've been to Orlando many times, but I knew that wherever they were going to go, wherever God called them, that it was going to be special and that God had an anointing, that God had a purpose, that God had a gift. And I tell you what, folks, they are a gift to this community. They're going to be a gift to the hundreds and thousands of people that are going to come through this school these next couple years 
as you guys move into your next, they're going to be a gift. And God is using them in powerful ways. And I want to encourage you guys to jump on board for what God's doing here at Story Church. Like I said, I'm from Virginia. Flew in yesterday. Got a direct flight. That's pretty amazing that you don't have to make connection in Atlanta. So, uh, but I'm here. Uh, we're doing the Disney thing. So my, uh, I know you guys are like, that's boring. We do that every day. But for those of us that don't live here, this is like a thing that you save up for for a year and you see the commercials and all the jazz. But my daughter, this is my daughter right here. Her name is Lily. And uh, I don't know if you can see her over this gigantic table, but that's her. Uh, she turns five years old tomorrow. And uh, so she flew on her first airplane here this morning and they just arrived. They're already at the resort and they're trying to rub it in. But I tell you what, I told them the spirit of the Lord is moving. So we here. And uh, this is my wife, Lindsay. Uh, we've been married, we'll be married 10 years in December. And uh, we were college sweethearts. Uh, funny story, we met in high school. Well, we didn't meet in high school. We went to the same high school, small, much smaller school than this. Went all four years to the same high school. We never met. Graduated the same year, same class, everything. We never met. We had mutual friends all across the board. And I met her, this is the truth, I met her on a date with one of her friends. I was on a date with one of her friends. And she said, oh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to this college. And I said, well, yeah, I'm going to this college. And then soon enough, we go to college together. We're both musicians. We both love the Lord. It just kind of grew. I'm just telling you, things happen. Um, I love that we're in this series this morning. Uh, and uh, just really excited about this because uh, talking about neighbors, talking about the story of the Good Samaritan. If you're, if you're a first time here last week, we are in, we're in the book of Luke and we're talking about uh, the Good Samaritan story. Anybody ever heard of this story? Okay. I'll just give you a quick paraphrase so you don't have to, to read it. It's very, very short. You could probably literally read, in a, read the whole thing in about 45 seconds. But the paraphrase is, there's, Jesus, is Jesus is telling this parable and there's a man, he gets robbed. He's on the road. He gets robbed. And, and two men walk past him, okay? A priest walks first, then a Levite, okay? And then a third person. Everybody say the third person. The third person, okay. It's very critical, I actually think. I think it's super spiritual that it is the third person. The third person that walks through is the Samaritan. And the thing about the Samaritan that we're gonna learn about is, is, is he, wasn't, he was from the other side of the tracks, if you know what I mean, okay? So the Samaritan wasn't like the guy. And... Uh, but anyways, the Samaritan goes to the man, he picks up the man, he takes the man to a place, and he puts the man in the place, it's, it's an inn, it's like a hotel, he puts the man in the place, and then he leaves the man there, and he gives the innkeeper money to take care of him, okay? That's the nutshell story, everybody with me? Okay, so it's, it's a really, really good story, and, and I have a question today that I wanted to ask, it's a very simple question, do you, see last week we talked about who are your neighbors? What are your neighbors? But this week we're talking about this question, and it's do you know who your neighbors are? K-N-O-W. Do you know who your neighbors are? And I looked up that great definition in Webster's that said, to know is to have developed a relationship with someone through meeting and spending time with them. And I kind of got to think about this, and I thought about this in, in my own life, how many of you know that before you can know something, you have to get to know something? Okay. When I met my wife, you want to go back to that picture of that hottie? Um, so when I met my wife, I didn't just know everything about her. I didn't even know her last name. I never even met her. I've been in school for her for four years. I didn't know who she was. It takes time. It took a process. See, I think when you want to get to know something, you have to develop it. It's relational. It's built. It's long-term. It's iron sharpens iron. See, the Bible says this, this in, in the Bible, it says iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I believe that we are built to build a foundation, and we're built to know and grow, okay? So you got to get to know. If you want to write that down, that's a cool. That just came to my brain, and I thought that was pretty cool. And let's talk about this Samaritan story. You see, like I said, about the Samaritan, the Samaritan was from the north side, okay? 
How many of you guys are from the South side? And when you talked about the North side people, it wasn't always favorable. Pastor Spencer uh, was telling me yesterday, was it Claremont that you played basketball against here? He was telling me, look, man, I, this place looks beautiful. This is a gorgeous area. But he was telling me that when he played basketball here, which it must've been a long time ago. I don't know how old you are, bro. But, um, but, but he said, he said that when he played basketball here in high school, that afterwards there was like people trying to fight them and throw oranges at their bus and other things. I'm assuming this was the north side or was this the south side? So this is the south. So you, so that makes sense, okay? That, that they were from the north. So anyways, anyways, to put it into, into practical perspective, the Samaritan was from the north. He was not religious in the sense of the people of the south. So you look at the priest, very religious, the Levite, very religious. They come from very traditional Jewish backgrounds. You could say that the Samaritan was not a religious man, okay? Samaritan didn't have this background. So when you look at this, uh, I was thinking about this story, and I, was, and I did a little bit of research on it because, you know, it, I, I like history and things like that. And, and it said that um, they had a divide 700 years prior, the North and the South. They had a divide 700 years prior. And I, I don't know about you, what is, the number seven means something to me, Okay completion. So here we go. We get this 700 years of divide between the Samaritans and the priests and Levites. And now you get this number of completion where this story is going to come together. And I thought that that was really interesting. Um, But this road that this man was on was called the bloody pass. Okay. It was called the bloody pass. Yeah. it, It wasn't, it wasn't like these nice smooth paved roads that we got here. It's probably more like the paved roads up in D.C., a couple hours from where I live, which are nasty, okay? They just need to do some road work. I'm just saying. But the bloody pass, and I thought this was interesting. It says, see, the, see, the road starts 1,200 feet above sea level. They took me out over here on the Citrus Tower. That was pretty far up. I thought that was pretty cool. I was like, well, that's, that's pretty cool. And then they wanted to fill me with this citrus orange coffee drink they got down there. And so, look, I'm on my vacation, but come on, folks, like, Y'all killing me. But it's at 1,200 feet above sea level and 2,000 feet below sea level. I thought that was really interesting. You, so you think about the road that this man had to go on, and I'm not entirely sure how far he was on his journey before he gets robbed, right? Gets mugged, he gets beat up. All this stuff happens to him. And I think it's interesting that Jesus chose the Samaritan for this story. And I think that Pastor Spencer mentioned this last week. But Jesus wanted to choose someone that could show to be a true servant. And I think something great about the Samaritan is that the Samaritan in this story is the hero. See, he's not a priest. He's not a Levite. He's not a pastor. Okay? He ain't some holy religious person. He's a non-believer. He didn't have faith. But Jesus chose him to be the hero. You see, uh, they just left, they left this man. And I I think what's, what's interesting after this man got robbed is he's left on the side of the road. The two men walk, but, but you see here, here's the thing. This is just so good. The man wasn't dead. It says, it says that he was left for dead, but he, he wasn't dead. Okay. You see, and, and I think they were getting caught up a little bit too much in their own religiousness. Too much of their law because it, I think it says in Numbers uh, 19, 11, it says that, you know, when, when you touch someone or something that some, it doesn't say someone, it says something that is unclean, that, that it's almost like a curse for seven days on your life. So when, when, you're, when you're going down and, and these two men pass by, they're almost seeing it like it's a curse because they think, this is key, they think that they're touching, they would, they would touch something that is dead. But the Bible says that he was left for dead, but he wasn't dead. And I got to tell you something. The priest walked by, the Levite walked by, the pastors walked by, the churchy people walk by. But let me tell you something. The Samaritan being the hero 
when he goes by and he stops. I believe he's doing something that I believe that God is calling us, and I know that he's called Pastor Spencer and Pastor Sarah to do, is to stop, is to look and say, look, I'm not looking at a dead thing. I'm looking at something that still has life. How many of you know that today God wants you to know you still have life? You still are breathing. Every breath is a gift. You're still breathing. You're still moving. God can, it still wants to use you. If you don't know him, he wants you to know him. I just thought that this was absolutely amazing and so gracious that you guys have such good pastors that can recognize that you are not dead. That there's many of us that feel like we're left for dead. I feel like we've been robbed of things. I met a girl not long ago, you know, she, she struggled. She had been raped when she was 15, 16 years old. And in a similar situation, felt like she was left for dead. And it wasn't until someone came around, someone that spoke into her life, a hero, stepped up and said, no, 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 that is not who you're called to be. That is not your identity. And thank goodness today that if you feel down, you feel like you have on the last leg, that you still have life, that you still have purpose. That he's still calling you, that he's still loving you, he's still speaking to you. Oh my goodness, it's already over, it's already past 11 o'clock. You didn't tell me that. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I got to roll right through this. Uh, so, so today I want to explore what makes uh, the Samaritan different. And, and right now I, I wanted to state to you, and, and I think it was my first point. Oh, it is here. That Jesus is choosing you and me today to be heroes. Okay. I'm not asking you to be Captain America. Look, I know that every guy in here wants to be Thor. (laughs) But that's that is not who he is calling us to be. And I want to I want to take it a little bit step step further here. I believe that Jesus is choosing you and me today to be servant heroes. Servant heroes. See, I want to clarify we are not saviors. We cannot redeem. We can't heal. But we believe, and I believe, that Jesus is looking for some heroes who are willing to step up and run into the fire. Run into the fire. And, and, and you know, the, the, the flip side is, is that many of us look like this. Is we, we say, well, if God's calling me, I feel very unqualified to be here. It's so wrong. This, this whole month, and you see all this, this political stuff, and we all know what this month is leading to and things that we've seen. When the devil wants to lie and when he wants to deceive, he deceives. He lies. And I believe one of the lies he tells many, many people, and many, many people that walk into church buildings all across the world every week, is that you are unqualified. That you are not good enough. But I'm telling you right now that Jesus is qualifying you. And he's asking you to step up to be a servant hero. So if you can hear the sound of my voice or that little online thing back there, I want you to know he is, Story Church is, we are all in need of servant heroes. In the scripture here in Luke 10, 33 through 34, it says, but a Samaritan as he had journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. I love that way it says that he went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring out oil and wine. You see, while the Samaritan is traveling, he saw the person. He saw the person. How many of you want to know that if you want to know someone, you have to see them first. You have to see them first. I believe that many Christians or people that profess to be Christians live with blind eyes. Live with blind eyes. They live with blindness or they live with tunnel vision or whatever have it. But if you think about it, when the Samaritan walks by, he's not looking at 
hundreds of years of, 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 of hate and difference between North and South. He's not looking at that. He just wanted to help someone because he saw the man. He saw the man. And here's what it is. This is another point. He did it at his personal risk and at personal cost. It was a risky move for him. I don't think it was just like easy, like, oh, stop, dude. Got you, bro. Come on. I don't think it was like that at all. I think it was a lineage issue. I think it was a legacy issue. I think it was dirty stinkiness issue. I think the guy probably weighed over 100 pounds. But I tell you this, this is my first point. Risk leads to reward. And cost shows the value. Risk leads to reward and cost shows the value. He took a personal risk. You see, I I looked this up to, to show the true meaning of compassion means to suffer together. You must be willing to give something up and here's the, this is this this wowed me this past week. You must be willing to give something up, but believe in the reward. You got to believe in the reward, and I mean that in the sense of I in, because a lot of us take this perspective of we want to believe for something. We want to believe for something, but you see, when I think of the word for f o r. When I think of this word, that to me is something that I want to see. I'm believing for Tom Brady to come back. I thought I think some of you Florida people were believing for that. I'm a Saints fan, and I didn't believe for that at all. It's my fault. <laughs> you guys are terrible. That's great. <laughs> but but here, check this out. So believing for something is, is something that we want to see. But when we believe in something, when you believe in something, you already know it's accomplished. You already know it's accomplished. The miracle will happen because we believe in a God who can do it. We believe in the reward. We believe in his perfect plan. Sometimes it's hard. Uh, I don't know if this is you. I don't, I don't know. But when I encounter a homeless person, you know, at a stoplight asking for money, I, you know, I don't know if it's you, but you, you, the question that usually is on our minds is, uh, what do I do if I give them my money? You know, uh, you see, for me, it's not hard to drive up and have compassion for someone. I think all of us, you see them right? You see them. It's hard to miss them. They're there. They're holding up a sign. But the thing is, when you feel compassion, you have to know when when you're going to take this risk. The problem is when you take the risk, it's hard for you to believe in the reward. Because you say, okay, I'll give them the money, but I'm going to question what are they going to do with my money. So I'm willing to take the risk. Hey, sure. Yeah, here's five bucks. Here's, here's some Chick-fil-A, Lord's Chicken. You know, but, but the problem is, if you don't believe that with whatever you're giving, that the reward's on the other side, that God is going to use it, that it's not your problem, that it's not your issue, Do it because you believe in the reward. I think that is so just, just, just justifies so many things in my life to stop my questions of doubt, to stop my thought process. And you ask, well, what, what could be the reward? What am I believing in for? I'm believing that people are coming to church. That's practical. I'm believing that people are going to know Jesus. Whoa. I'm believing people are going to get saved. I'm believing that that people's bodies that are broken are going to be healed. (laughs) 
Why does it matter if I'm giving money to this person or that person or this situation or that situation? I'm believing in the reward. I'm believing in the blessing. And I think that's exactly how the Samaritan went. He didn't have a notion of what the risk was going to be. He just knew that the reward was that the man was going to get back and be healed. And, man, i got to skip through some notes. What time? My goodness, it's just crazy. <laughs> Do you believe the Lord is guiding your steps to reward you? That's the question. Just ask. You just got to be faithful to what he's calling you to do. I think about this. <laughs> Anybody like Starbucks? Okay. As an every once in a while thing for me, it's not like every day. It's just on every corner, so it's accessible. It's, that's it's true, you know. But when you're in the Starbucks line ordering your $12 non-fat mocha frappuccino with three pumps of sugar-free vanilla ice latte... I think about what that looks like, and I, what I don't seem to realize is there's another person behind me about to order their $12 mocha frappuccino latte. They've walked the same steps that I've walked. They chose to go to that place that time. They're in line behind me. What's the difference? I think the possible difference is they don't know Jesus. The possible difference is they have no reward. And, and I'm, thinking about, I'm thinking about this concept. If they're not saved, what does it look like? They're on the fast track to H-E double hockey sticks. You can call it hell if you want. Sometimes I think hell just sticks better because people need to know it's real. And thinking about this, can I, can I use you for a second? Here, here. I'm just going to get down here. Is it okay if I get down here? Okay. Okay. Sorry, camera people. We love you. All right. Pastor Spencer, I'm going to use him as an example. Thinking about this, let's use this Starbucks example because I love practical things, right? I'm a practical kind of guy. Um, here's the thing. I believe that I'm a believer. I know that I'm a Christian. I know that God uses me. He calls me. He's blessed me. I go to church every Sunday. I'm in the Starbucks line ordering my $12 drink, and it's a small. He represents that person I was just describing behind me. He's behind me. This is us. This is not, I'm not saying this is you. This is just the normal and there's Christians that do this because I believe that there's a lot of people that are going to go to church today that on Monday they're going to stand in a Starbucks line just like this. He's going to hell. He's going to hell. And I think about this concept because I think the best thing and the second thing that the Samaritan does, he turns around. See, here's the thing. Can you, can you lay down and act dead for a second? Whatever's more comfortable for you. He's a gym teacher, so this is easy. Here we go. Here we go. Just stay with me for a second. I'm almost done. Oscar winning performance. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Understand this. Here's the priest. Here's the Levite. Here's the Samaritan. Okay. Okay. Just go ahead. I'll help you up. Okay. So understand this. Starbucks line, practical. No different. Are you going to turn around? Because the Samaritan saw him and he turned around. You got to see him. You got to make the turn. And put your hands out like this. Turn, turn this way, so this, this is a good one. Folks, this looks like a cross. This represents Jesus. How many of you are being priests? How many of you are being Levites? 
folks, be a Samaritan. Turn around. See him for who he is. He wants to bring you in. He wants you to pick him up. That's good. Thank you so much. I'm trying to tell you. He wants to pick you up. He wants to bring you in. And I believe that if we're called to be the hands and feet, we have to take a risk. We have to believe in the reward. We have to believe that there's this little thing that I love called divine appointment. I promise you I'm almost done. And divine appointment states that everywhere you go, that there's always something, someone. You're going to encounter these divine appointments every day where God has just put planted someone because somebody told that person that woke up, you should go to Starbucks that morning. Somebody told you to do it. At that time, that day, right then. I'm just using Starbucks as a practical example just so you guys can understand. This can be anywhere. And I called that illustration, I call that goofy spiritual, but I feel like that represents the case that we can fall in sometimes. Samaritan turns around in verse 34. I don't know if it's up here or not, but verse 34 says, he went to him, bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey in his own Corvette. I don't know what y'all drive down here in fancy Florida Ferraris. I don't know if y'all are that fancy or not. Not you. But anyways, let's check this out. He brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. You see, if I see someone, if I turn around, if I head towards them, the last thought is that I have to take them somewhere. Samaritan picks the man up, takes him to the inn. Okay? Somewhere. How many of you know church, story church, is somewhere? I believe it with all my heart, and I believe that this is a healthy place because when I think about the inn, I think of it as a place where this man was going to go to heal, a place where this man was going to go to grow. I don't think of the church as any different. Now, I think you make some great innkeepers. I just think you guys do. And to rush through this real quick, thinking about that, that Starbucks illustration, I go to this conversation about brokenness and struggle. When I invite someone to the house of the Lord, when I see them, when I turn around, I bring them to the inn, we always tend to miss out on step four. Step four, they show up, they're sitting here. They come to your small group. They just want to hang out with you, talk to you. What do you do? I'm not saying this is you, but I've seen this time and time again. You ignore them. You leave them. You, you don't talk to them. You just, okay, that's fine. And I have a story. I have a picture of a guy with, holding a guitar. Really quick story. I know it's, a, it's an old picture. I pulled it off Facebook. This guy's name is Justice Taylor. Justice sold me a few cars. Where he was a, he's a car salesman and sold me a few cars about five years ago. Maybe, maybe a little longer, about six, seven, maybe. Justice was a super talented, super well-spoken young man, probably about 21, 22 years old. Played guitar, so as we're, I didn't know him prior, so when I came to the dealership, you know when you come to the dealership and like the salesmen are like, let's go get them. Um, this guy got to me first. This guy got to me first. So like I said, over like a six-month period, I buy two different cars from this guy. I just really liked him. I liked his character. And I, and I kept inviting him to church. Like I just felt like that was my divine appointment, was to help this guy, Justice Taylor, go to church. And sure enough, we had a young adult group that met on a Monday night. This is about six years ago. 
Justin, Ju- Justin comes to church first time. I'm there. I'm present. I got him there. I saw him. I turned. I got him to the inn, but I left him there. Where am I? I'm back in the offices hanging out with the pastors. Back just doing my own thing. The service happens. No one talks to him. He's introduced to no one. Justin Taylor leaves. I don't hear from Justin again to about two years later. I had a friend who knew Justin in high school and I was just out to lunch with him. And he said, oh yeah, I went, I went to this high school. I said, man, do you know this guy, Justin Taylor? He's probably about your age. And he said, yeah, I do. And I said, how's he doing, man? I said, Ryan, he, he killed himself two years ago. What? One of the hardest things to even swallow. He said he killed, he killed himself. He committed suicide. I lived with guilt for a while with that because I did those three things right. I saw him, I turned, I got him to the end, but then I left him. I think what's great about this story is that when the innkeeper, when he got to the end, the Samaritan just didn't just leave him there. He did the fourth thing. He insured. He insured that the man was there. Yeah, the next day, he took the money, the nari, and he gave it to the innkeeper. And he said, look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. He ensured that the man was going to get better. Folks, when you come to church, I want you, or when you're in life, or when you're meeting people that just don't know Jesus, you got to put some insurance behind it. You got to love on some people. So for this concept... If you want to know someone, I believe, and this is my last point. Oh, I skipped my second point. I don't mean to do that. I just got real excited. But I'm just going to go to point three. When you want to know someone, they want to be known by you. They want to be known by you. Relationship is key. We live in a world where people are getting more and more separated, where technology makes us more and more separated where we can't even, most, most kids probably won't even know how to have conversations. They want to be known. Continually do life with someone. And I like to say, we don't know where the story goes beyond that, but I'd like to say that the Samaritan became a friend of the man when he got healed. I like to say that their broken relationship was mended. The lineage was, was mended here. To, to be known by someone? What does it feel like to be part of someone's salvation story? That's no greater gift. When you're known to be a part of someone else's salvation story. I'm going to ask Pastor Spencer to come on up here. There's no better place to know someone, to grow with someone, to be healthier than to be in God's house. And a great place to start, and I think what we all want to see in the miracle is we want to see you know Jesus. We want to see you know Jesus. Why? Because people need Jesus. We need Jesus. I'm going to ask Pastor Spencer just to take over right here, lead you guys in an altar time, pray for you guys. If you know folks that don't know Jesus, If you want to pray for those divine appointments this coming week, right now, after we leave here, they're there. Search, seek, and find Pastor Spencer. I'll go ahead and give Ryan a hand clap. That was awesome. I love what he's saying about we need to know our neighbors, and they need to be known by us as well, right? And the Word of God is so cool. Like, I'm a preacher, so I'm sorry if you got somewhere to go or you need lunch, but I'm going to give you a little bit extra here. This, like, you don't even have to tip it. No, I'm just kidding. You're good. This is extra. This is extra. 
The word no in the Bible is the Greek word gnosis or gnoskis, which means to experientially know God. And so I think this is so cool what Ryan is pointing out in this because the Samaritan wanted to know this man. And we're called as a church, one of our core values here at Story Church is to choose others. And when we choose somebody, it's not just a mental assent of, okay, I know their name. Okay, I, I invited them. I threw a, a card on their window. Great. To know them means to know their hurt, their pain, their smell, their situations, their highs, their lows, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and love them anyways. And so when we say choose others, that's what we mean here at Story Church. We mean that you are called to choose others by knowing them experientially. Like God talks about, like the Bible talks about knowing God, right? That's how we are called to know our Heavenly Father. And the way people on this planet get to know our Heavenly Father that way is through you. Through reading their Bible, yes. But more importantly, the Bible says we are living epistles. We are called to read, to be read by others, and to present scripture through our lives. I'm going to leave you with one scripture, and then I'm going to pray for salvations, those online, those in this place. 1 Timothy 1, it says, For we reach the goal of fulfilling all the commandments when we love others deeply with a pure heart, a clean conscience, and a sincere faith. A pure heart clean conscience, and a sincere faith. Did we just turn around like Ryan said? Did we look at them? Did we invite them? And then we, did we leave them? Is your conscience clear? Did you do all the things that God has called you to do, or did you stop with one of them? Right? Like, I want to be clear here that the Bible isn't a works-based thing, but someone's salvation may be based on the works that you present in their life. Okay? Parts of the Bible says that there's no way to heaven except through Jesus and his righteousness, correct? But James also says that faith without works is dead. So where does the line meet up? It meets up on the cross. And so I need you to see that through Jesus, Jesus is calling you to do some things once you have said, I accept you, Lord. You can no longer shy away and say, I don't know them. If you choose to do that, that's on you. But once you know Jesus and you know his word, you are now responsible to do and live his word. It's pretty clear. All right, that's my soapbox. And I love Pastor Ryan's message. It was great. Um, so what we're going to do now in this time, I'm just going to pray for those that need to get to know Jesus. We had an awesome ministry moment earlier, but if there's anyone in this place or anyone online that does not know the Lord and wants to, on the count of three, I want you to just shoot up your hand with every head bowed and every eye closed. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he's got good neighbors for your life. And three, he loves you today more than he ever has. And so if that's you right now, if you need to know Jesus or you want to accept this Jesus for the first time in your life, go ahead and shoot your hand up right now in this room. Anyone online as well, just let us know in the comments section if that's you. If there's anyone else in here today with every head bowed and every eye closed and you say, Pastor Spencer, I know Jesus, but I, I really like, man, this message hit home to me and I need to recommit my life to him. I need to you know, re-up my neighborliness. I need to do a little bit more of what God is calling me to do. I want to look more like this man who, who helped this, this falling guy in the Good Samaritan story. If that's you and you're in here today, go ahead and raise your hand as well. If you just say, I need to live a little bit more like the Good Samaritan. If there's anyone in here today, just go ahead and shoot your hand up. That's awesome. I see those hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Online, if that's you, let us know. We'd love to see you. We'd love to talk to you about that as well. So no one in here prays the salvation prayer alone, so let's pray this prayer together. Dear Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for dying, going to hell, and resurrecting so that I might have life. 
Thank you for being my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. Y'all go ahead and hand clap for anyone in here online that raised their hands today. We like to celebrate that. That is a huge win. You guys, we thank you so much for showing up. If you will, just go ahead and stand real quick. Stay in your seats. We want to worship our Heavenly Father one more way this morning, and we love to worship Him through our tithes and offerings. If this is your home church, we would love for you to start to partner with us through the tithes and offerings. If you're already doing that, we thank you for making Story Church possible. There's some exciting outreaches coming up this summer that will not happen without your tithes and offerings being able to reach out into the community. I got to read a story in our stand-up meeting uh, earlier today, and I want to tell you this is because of your tithes and offerings. The online stuff, the wins that we experience in this place is because of what you give and what you do in this place. And there was a, a lady who messaged us online a few weeks ago that when Jim was in here preaching and talking about PTSD, and I just want to share this with everybody. This lady literally wrote to us and told us that she really felt like there was no reason left to live. And she came across this message, and she heard the message of God's grace and love and mercy that in the middle of what someone might be going through, he can still work in their lives. And she thanked us and thanked us and thanked us throughout that message, and she had no idea that there was a church like this that believed that about God in this community and whether she ever walks through those doors or not, that's another life that is still here, that is still loving, that is still caring, that is still breathing, that is still a neighbor because of what you guys do week in and week out in this church. And so we endeavor every time not just to ask for your money, but to let you know what it is actually doing. Okay, the money is a necessity in this world. God doesn't need it, but people need to know the gospel and that takes money to get it out. Okay, so there's a few ways you can do that. You can scan this QR code up here. Um, you can text the word honor to the number 94,000, or you can go to storychurchfl.com backslash giving. Or we also have an amazing way. There's a bucket in the back um, that you can just drop your tithes and offerings in. There's an envelope in your seat. Also, if you have your connection card on the way out, if you are a first time guest, I encourage you to fill that out. We do want to send you a Chick-fil-A gift card in the mail and thank you for coming and hopefully take you out to eat. So if you would, please fill that out. Um, and again, my wife and I would love to meet you on the way out as well if there's any first-time guests in here too. So thank you guys for coming. Have a blessed week. You guys take care. Have a wonderful day.